Now, just something I wanted to elaborate, please use a bit, um, is Milo as well. Um, remember in Milo, uh, we have uh, here, as well as the announcements that I make, if I go to content, and I'm, I'm looking at this as a student at this moment. Um, so in the content, we have obviously your lecture recordings, but you're here today, so that's a start. But uh, for your lectures, there's always the handout and the things of them associated with the lecture, the, the PowerPoints, reading material associated. So today we have Hermiptera uh, there. Um, we also have um, videos shown in the labs, which are here. Uh, which we've got later on too, and then videos, where is another one here, PowerPoint show, links to videos relating to lecture content, so here's a whole lot of things today, we have, uh, there's one here on digestion and excretion, but you can see every time you just click on those and you'll be able to look at, at videos, so make the most of those, as well as the announcements that are there, I know this announcement today was around the light trapping, which I've already mentioned to you, but for those of you who weren't here, uh, to begin with, um, lab coats is the other thing that I really want to emphasise tomorrow. Uh, no turning up without a lab coat. Just make sure I have actually got this running, which I have. Good. Okay. Let's make a start. Well, as I said, it sort of forms a pre-lab to the lecture to the lab, which is going to be on hemiptera this week. Okay, so <clears throat> hemiptera are uh, generally considered the uh, true bugs by, by entomologists. So when people talk about bugs, the Joe Blow on the street, they prefer to all insects. But now you're going to be trained entomologists. Bugs are going to be hemiptera, not bugs, right? So that's what we've got to think of. And hemi means half or half hardened. So we have a half hardening here on the forewing of uh, many of hemiptera, but not all of them. So this is the kind of structure that I want to move through in each of the five lectures that we'll have looking at the five major large insect orders. So we looked at the uh, introduction briefly, their evolution, what is, what does it define that insect belong to that order, what is it about the immature stages, interesting aspects of general and relevant aspects of general biology, their general econo economic impact and some pest case studies. So we'll move through all of these in that particular fashion. Okay, as I've already said, uh, hemiptera are true bugs, and globally we have about 100,000 described species across 145 families. Probably around double that really do exist, but they're just not yet either being found or described. Um, in terms of that 100,000, we have around 4,000. Uh, of that 100,000 being aquatic or semi-aquatic in about 20 of those families. In terms of that number, 100,000 and described species, we said there's about over a million described species of insects around that, so it's about 10% of all described species of insects in Mictera, but it's uh, nothing compared to beetles, which we'll do uh, in a future lecture. In size, they can be very, very small, up to about 11 millimetres, or uh, 11 centimetres or so in size. In Australia, we've got 6,000 species of Hemiptera, and in Tasmania, we have about 650. So it's, there's nothing unusual about the Hemiptera fauna uh, in Australia or Tasmania relative to the world. It's sort of representative of what we might expect. They're not over or underrepresented in terms of that. <coughs> um, so that uh, provides a sort of a brief overlook of them. And if we compare that, say, uh, 6,000 species of Hemiptera alone described in Australia. We've got, I think, 828 species of bird, so way down at that. Or in Tasmania, we've got uh, 262 species. So in Hemiptera alone, we've got more Hemiptera species in Tasmania described than we have even uh, bird species. Um, so a lot, and that's only 10% of the insect fauna. Plant feeding, we've already had a look at this uh, in the earlier lectures, so we now know that uh, plant feeding is the major uh, activity for diet for Hemiptera. Not as much as I thought. Um, so we've got around 91% of plant feeders. We'll look at some of those that aren't plant feeders uh, within the context. Okay, let's just look how we've got to be uh, an order, Hemiptera, in terms of timeline and uh, general evolution. 
So I use these uh, here again, so a number of different eras from the Carboniferous through to the Jurassic to the Cretaceous. We look at Hemiptera, which are here. We can see they were uh, present over 300 million years ago. And many of those that we now identify as Hemiptera um, today are pretty similar to what they looked like over 280 million years ago. So there has been not necessarily a lot of change. The interesting thing, though, if we compare this to what we're going to look at in future weeks, is that there's quite a radiation quite early on, you know, 250, 200 million years ago, big radiation in terms of number of species of Hemiptera that existed, and a slightly larger one just at the top here. And if we look at this little schematic down here, and we look at when things started to come, so uh, the origin of plants was around the same time as when the Hemiptera were there, but the ones that became... Um, the pines, the gymnosperms, the first seed plants, were around here when they started to arrive. So with their wonderful sucking mouth parts, they could pretty much exploit those gymnosperms very early on. So that's why we got a fair radiation of them to begin with. And then when the angiosperms, the flowering plants, started to radiate more like you know, over 100 million, somewhere between 200 and 100 million years ago, we get another uh, increase here. So early on, quite a large amount of them present um, because they could exploit all the plant resources that were out there. In terms of their phylogenetic relationship to all the others, we've seen this slide already, but they are most closely related to three other orders, uh, the book lice, the lice, and the thrips. Okay, so they're in their little group on their own. Remember, all of this little grouping has some weird and funky developmental things that go on with some families in those groups, which we spoke about in um, the lecture on lecture three on development and reproduction. Okay, so what's a bug? What makes a hemiptera hemiptera? Well, fortunately it's really an easy one when it's hemiptera. It comes down to the mouth parts. It's that large needle-like hinged stylet. As you can see here from this bug turned upside down here. And it's the, the mandibles and the maxilla, if you remember, resting in a groove labium. So nice long uh, sucking mouth parts. As a consequence, because they're not really tasting things much, they don't have any maxillary or labial pouts, which we often see around things with um, chewing mouth parts that are quite close to their food resources. They're feeding these, are plumbing into their food resource to get access to it. So we don't have maxillary and labial pouts. So that is the key characteristic uh, that enables us to see that a nitra is a nitra. Okay, let's have a look at that again from um, the lecture we did on mouth parts and digestion. Just to refresh, uh, mandibles and maxilla here and the labium that it's um, actually sheathed in. You can see that on this side here. And when it comes down to looking at how it looks in cross-section, we can see it produces a food channel and a salivary channel. And that salivary channel turns out to be quite important when it comes to transmissions of many diseases and viruses. So we'll revisit that in the course of the lecture. Other things that do uh, occur with um, bugs is that their prothorax and mesothorax are large, the metathorax is small. So that last one associated with the third pair of legs is small. Venation on the wings can be reduced, and some of them have lost wings altogether. Uh, and male scale insects only have one pair of wings, so um, some level of difference there, um, similar to flies with only one pair of wings. The other thing, and you were looking at those in the lab last week, and I'm sure Rayleigh had a picture up there, abdominal cerci, which you were looking to try and get your orders sorted in the hemimetabolus, they don't have any abdominal cerci indeed. Of the five major orders we are going to look at lecture by lecture, this is the only hemimetabolous order. All the rest of them are polymetabolous orders. In terms of appearance, though, they can look pretty weird. So here is a couple of examples of the slightly weirder. Uh, this one, um, you'd still notice it would have a mouth part underneath, but you can see it's quite an interesting um, structure on the outside. But the ones I really want to point towards are some of the scale insects where basically they have a, a waxy covering over them. Uh, they're plumbed into the particular line here that they're going to stay there for their whole lifetime feeding on. 
and you know that you wouldn't see any feature on there other than if you lifted it up and pulled it out, you'd see that long style of mouth part. Okay. Sometimes legs are reduced, uh, all sorts of things are reduced when it comes down to, to some of the appearances. Okay, now there is um, classification which some of the taxonomists have helped make harder for us, but I want to just use it as a way of organising thoughts more than actually knowing what the names are. So under the old scheme you had two major groupings or suborders, Homoptera and Heteroptera. Heteroptera are the larger bugs, um, Homoptera are the small ones like psyllids, whiteflies, aphids, etc. But now we've got DNA and cladistic analysis and all sorts of other things. We've broken up the Homoptera into three uh, groupings, known and they are a mouthful, Sternorinca, Orchinorinca and Coleorinca. So the Sternorinca are the psyllids, the whiteflies, the aphids and many of the scales. The Orchinorinca include cicadas, leafhoppers, treehoppers, etc. And Coleorinca are two really obscure little groups um, that I will uh, visit in a moment. If we're into these, and the heteroptera are the true bugs, so <clears throat> if we're to look at where the mouth part arises from, we can already break these three groups up, the Sternorinca, the Orchinorinca, and the heteroptera. So have a look in here. We've got three options. And I think we'll look at this in the lab if we set it up for you as well. Here, the rostrum or the mouth part is arising from the front of the head, okay? And as you can see here, right up the front. So these are the heteropterans, the true bugs. Now these have a different feeding mechanism as we'll learn as we go through the lecture. The second one here is where the actual rostrum arises from the rear of the head. You can see it here. And here's the rear of the head here on this cicada and you can see it arising uh, from here. And the third option is that it arises uh, between nearly the front pair of legs. And here you can see it arising just between the front pair of legs here. And this one is the sternal rink of things like aphids. So we've got here aphids, <coughs> cicadas, true bugs. So if you look at the position of where that rostrum arises from, you can already get some clues about diet, clues about probability of being a pest, etc. But we'll, we'll revisit those as we go through. Let's just have a look at some of those um, uh, groupings first and say a little bit about each of those. Okay, so the Sternorinca are here, um, and these include uh, things like the psyllids, uh, you can see here the aphids, and this one's the scale, so cottony cushion scale. I'm trying to find where I'm up to in notes here. Okay, so these are typically uh, flow-on feeders, so uh, high carbohydrate sugar diets, and they when they have wings, they generally hold them roof-like over their abdomen, as you can see here in the psyllids, and they would be if that aphid was winged. Um, so their forewings are generally uh, membranous, and they're not hardened or half-hardened like a lot of the true bugs are, and fairly uniform in texture, so they all look uh, fairly similar if they have wings. We've already talked about where the rostrum arises from, and we've talked about the fact that male and females can be fairly different. The Orchinorinca um, includes things like the cicadas, the tree hoppers, and some of the uh, various leaf hoppers, this being a Fulgorid here. One of the characteristics, aside from the rostrum position of the Orchinorinca, is that they actually have very simple antenna, little whip like antenna. When we went back and we looked at here in the stern, uh, sorry, in the Sternorinca, you can see quite long antenna. Uh, but here in the Orchinorinca, they're just like little hair whips on them, okay? So we know from looking at the antenna, sometimes they've got expansions on them, that it belongs to the Orchinorinca. The other thing that's interesting about the Orchinorinca is it has a lot of acoustic communication, sound communication in that group, or vibrational communication. And we'll revisit that in the lecture and in the lecture on communication uh, indeed later. This is that little weird group, the Coleorinca. They're um, you know, two little uh, families that we really don't know a lot about. They're Gondwanan in origin, which means that they, well, they're Gondwanan, they only reside in areas like South America, Australia, New Zealand, um, Southern Africa, those sort of areas for Gondwanan. Um, so um, they're primitive, 
Uh, we know uh, for the ones in Australia, we've got, let's see, 32 species in the world, about 12 species in Australia and two species in Tasmania. They can be found in moss, moss dwelling, but they're very cryptic in these wet mosses, and all but one species is flightless. So we really don't know a hell of a lot about these. But interestingly, about two years ago, um, they got into New Zealand uh, from the importation of man ferns uh, from Tasmania into New Zealand, we would believe, or from Victoria into New Zealand. So um, they have invaded that area. I don't really know the consequences of that. But it's interesting that something that's so flightless and so cryptic and so hard to find suddenly manages to invade another continent. So they're almost living fossils in sort of rainforest areas. Okay, the Heteroptera is the largest of the groupings. Uh, about 80 of those 145 families uh, in the Heteroptera. Uh, they have a number of different things. Their wings, when held at rest, are generally held flat over their body, which you can see here, wings held flat over the body, as opposed to roof-like. Um, their four wings have that thickening that we said for Hemiptera is what, uh, partly how it got its name. So that four-wing thickening here, it's not thick here, but it's thick in there. You can see it again on here. Um, we've already talked about where their rostrum arises from. The nymphs very much resemble adults, so immature would look like adults. It's where all the aquatic species are. And they also have something known as uh, uh, communication as uh, chemical communication is their main method of communication, rather than acoustic, which we saw in the Orchidorhynchus. Now, if you were to look at an adult um, in this uh, Heteroptera, particularly things like stink bugs, if you look between in the um, mesosternum or the metasternum, actually it's in the metasternum, I think. Um, let me have a look here. Yes, yeah, the metapleural thoracic scent gland. So this is in the thorax, so it's in the metasternum here. You can see these little plate-like things here, which are where the, um, the insect produces its chemicals, be it pheromones or defense, pheromo oh, defense chemicals, etc. So you know, pick these things up, you do notice smells in quite a lot of the families. Uh, if you look at that from an immature, do I need to go immature yet? Uh, no, I won't. I'll take that from there. Okay. Let's have a look at immature now, overall. And um, when we looked at immature originally, remember we had uh, something that looked like this uh, in our development um, lecture. So here we have uh, first instar nymphs, second instar they're nymphs. Remember the hemimetabolus, so they've got that ecto or wing developing on the outside. But they look very much like the adults in these cases. So uh, nothing surprising there in development. When we look at the um, heteroptera in terms of the position of those thoracic um, scent glands, which were on the meta metathorax, they actually are different in um, the immatures. So rather than being there, they're dorsally along the back, along um, three little glands along the scent. So if you want to um, stroke the back of a heteropteran, uh, if it's immature, that's where you'll get your smells from, uh, so underneath if there is an adult. Um, so uh, different locations for whatever reason. Uh, when I looked at this one here, we said they look very similar, but there are some groups that have very different looking immature stages. This one would confuse anyone, and rightly so, are uh, white flies, which are a major glasshouse pest. So one of our major crop pests and glasshouse pests. Um, they don't look anything like the adult. So the adult is here, and this is the immature. So very, very different. And if you remember, uh, when I spoke about development, we had some scale insects, um, some white flies as examples, and thrips as examples. They have um, uh, a, a nymphal stage that is a resting stage, much like a pupae as well. So they're another one of those with a very funky looking um, development and also a very different looking immature to adult stage. All right, let's have a look at some of the aspects of general biology that I want to talk about with uh, Nectera and how these might be relevant to certain aspects and understanding. The first one is eggs. So what do what they generally do in egg-laying behaviour? 
Uh, commonly, they lay their egg on a substrate being typically a plant, uh, but many of them actually embed it with an ovipositor into the plant itself. So if you're looking for cicada eggs, for instance, it's going to be uh, embedded through the ovipositor into the plant material itself, the plant tissues. Um, some of them uh, will produce um, offspring underneath their bacillus. Um, scale insects, for instance, uh, their offspring are produced underneath them, uh, and sometimes, in some instances, they're also produced as um, viviparous or live birth, but not just eggs. Um, many of those smaller insects, the Sturtorinca and the Orchidorinca, cover their eggs in wax as a protection against uh, predators. And there's quite a few interesting examples in the Hemiptera of guarding of eggs and sometimes young. So this one here is um, commonly known as a toe biter, but Bellastomatidae, that you'll see them in the lab this week in the uh, reference collection. Big things, that's sort of those 11 centimetre things. Um, but they actually, the female lays their eggs on the back of the male, and the male actually uh, moves around and looks after the eggs until they hatch. So the male's the one who does the pregnancy, if you like. And then we have quite a few examples and some nice photos here of guarding of eggs. So here we have a female uh, guarding her eggs, and in these two cases here we've got mothers guarding their offspring. And this is not uncommon, and one of the reasons that guarding is beneficial is that there are a lot of natural enemies that want to eat nice resource there like eggs that can't fight back. Um, uh, and parasitic wasps. So if you actually do experiments where you remove these um, guarding adults from their offspring, um, you find huge differences in the survival of offspring. So it is a very effective way of looking after them, but there's a bit of investment on the part of the parents uh, for doing that. But if you're exposed on a, a limb or a leaf, it does make some sense. Okay, so we we'll look a little bit in Hemiptera, particularly at defences, because remember I said um, if you're got a feeding on, say, phloem or xylem, you're sort of, in many cases, if you're scale insects, and, and in many of the, the hopper feeders, but they can move around more, you're basically in one position for a very long period of time, if not for the whole immature development. That leaves you vulnerable to predation, uh, parasitic wasps and other things. So many of them have produced waxy substances, either soft waxes, as you can see here, so we've got soft scales, uh, we have hard scales, as you can see here, or cottony scales, as you can see on this one, which is mealybugs and some aphids have a, a cottony wax over them. Um, and some uh, nymphs also uh, produce a wax too in the folkorids. So there are, uh, in not in the organ rinker, but particularly in the sterner rinker, which are the flow and feeders, uh, these uh, protective sort of ways of making them less vulnerable to predation. There is one here, um, the spittle boats, which is in itself very interesting uh, as an approach. And these are uh, organ rinker, again, so not in the flow and feeders, but they are actually a flow and feeder uh, in the organ rinker, not a xylem feeder. I can't remember that now, I could think that through. Um, let's say they're feeding on plant uh, flower more xylem. Um, feed on roots or stems, so they're probably xylem feeders actually. Uh, but what they do is they produce a spittle. So it looks like someone spat on a plant, but what it's actually doing is they're taking in air uh, through an abdominal channel, pass through the anal excretion like you would like a bubble that with a straw and a milkshake to bubble up and produce this foam, which then means that they are protected underneath this foam from attack by natural enemies, so spittle bugs. Okay, if you are feeding with your uh, stylet, how do you get into the plant itself? Well, uh, you've got a mandible on the maxilla and you use them to uh, push against each other, so we've got one side goes down then another side, then the other one comes through, then one side goes down again, and the other one. So the mandibles are forcing their way through, and then the maxilla is following uh, through in there, which is where the um, actual salivary channel and the food channel is here are the maxilla doing the work on the outside. If you're a sternorinca, you feed uh, on phloem. So I've already said that, sugary products, aphids. Orchinorinca, 
you can feed on fly or more xylem, and here's my answer that I was just going to say. Uh, spittle bugs uh, are xylem feeders, and also some of the tree hoppers are xylem feeders. So we've got quite a few of the xylem feeders, which aren't a particularly nutritious resource, uh, but quite a few fly on feeders, and sometimes feeding on the leaf itself. But up here, all fly on feeders. The uh, Gondwana group, the Coleorinca, we've no idea what they feed on, don't know anything about them. And the Heteroptera are much more varied. They're not fly on more xylem feeders, so if you get one of these big ones, um, it's going to be either parenchyma, which is leaf cells, um, seed, predatory, or blood grazing. So with a Heteroptera or a Hemiptera, firstly, if we see damage on a plant, if we see chewing damage, we know it's not going to be a Hemiptera, right? Because they just don't have the mouth parts to do it. If they're transmitting a virus, which is likely to come through the phloem or xylem, it's not going to be a Heteroptera. It's going to be one of these, the Sternorinca or the Orchinorinca, that are more likely to be uh, any sort of disease transmitter than these guys. And we'll talk about that in their feeding pattern. So this is this feeding pattern. Um, and we've mentioned it in the previous lecture, so we're revisiting a little bit. But they're not actually, but this is, um, say, an aphid, as I say here, putting down with that salivary gland its sheath. But remember what I was saying, it wasn't actually puncturing cells, it was finding its way between cells. So it's very, very flexible, weaving its way through there into the phloem uh, to feed on the phloem and leaving that stylet sheath behind or sausage like skin made from the salivary secretions. So that's basically plumbing in. Once it's in there, it can spend its lifetime there, or if it weighs one that does move around a bit for a period of time and then move on. But quite long periods of time, um, getting lots and lots of uh, fluid coming through. If you're in the heteroptera, though, you don't do that. They have another method of feeding, which is known as lacerate and flush. So what they're doing is their stylets or that maxilla is pushing down into the parenchyma of say a leaf or a seed or something like that <coughs> and then uh, they're putting saliva down with that and it's producing a soup if you like so they're lacerating cutting it up as much as they can making it as liquid giving it a bit of saliva in there and then sucking it up like a straw you know from that so they're lacerating flush so they're not going into phloem they're not going into xylem and not transmitting through the plant very quickly like you would uh, if you're in flow and in terms of transmitting diseases and things around. So a different method. Now remember we say um, xylem is very low in protein, rich in ions, low in organic compounds, low osmotic pressure. So not necessarily low, uh, a lot of pressure there, but flow is really high in sugars and really high osmotic pressure. So when you're plumbing into flow you've got to get rid of it very quickly, which is what we said with those filter feeders, okay? And that again was a reminder from the lecture we've just had that you have that filter system where their hind gut wraps around and gets rid of a lot of that water and sugar content quite quickly rather than going through the mid gut where you're trying to actually get the digestion and absorption. What that does mean though is they produce um, copious amounts of um, something known as honeydew, which is a polite way of saying you know, insect piss, I guess. Um, and that honeydew is very sugary and it has consequences for um, uh, damaging uh, uh, crops and uh, particularly uh, table fruit and other things. So we'll have a, a few more slides of that. It also, ironically, comes around when, I think, uh, in biblical terms, there's a, a terminology known as manna from heaven, um, which apparently God provided to the Israelites but it probably was just that they were sitting under a bunch of trees um, that were um, being fed on by these flow and feeders and all that lovely manna or sugary stuff coming down was just being pissed on by insects and not indeed by God. So um, uh, that's uh, honeydew for you. Predation. Okay. Predation is common only in the Heteroptera and they can be opportunistic predators, so they'll do plants but occasionally be a predator or they'll be basically full-on predators. And we have quite a few groups that are real beneficials. Um, uh, in that groups we have assassin bugs, the redubids, and this group here known as the pirate bugs, the anthocorids, and these ones are commercially reared by biocontrol insectaries and released into crops, like cotton crops and things, for controlling 
uh, a number of different um, immature, mostly Lepidoptera, but beetles and things as well. Um, so we do have uh, quite a number of beneficial uh, hemiptera that are used um, in biocontrol or encouraged in biocontrol. We do have another option here, uh, which is if they're not predators, there is some groups that have decided that blood is the diet that they would want to take on. And we've got two classic examples of those, uh, both in the assassin bug family, which are predators, but they've taken predation to another extent and become, um, uh, yeah, uh, blood feeders. Well, the first one actually is in the family known as the Simicidae, or the bed bugs, okay? So you can see here a bed bug, and this is a poster that I picked off uh, last night saying bed bugs are becoming frequent flyers. So the issue with bed bugs is becoming huge around the world. I think 20 years ago you wouldn't even thought about bed bugs, but because of uh, travel everywhere around the world and Airbnbs and hostels and everything else and places through the United States, New York is infested with bed bugs. Um, we've got bed bugs down here. We're getting cases of bed bugs all the time now, uh, which we would never have had before. Uh, pretty nasty in terms of um, trying to get rid of them out of a household. Uh, but they are certainly uh, one of the major uh, blood feeders. The other one we've got here is um, this uh, assassin bug. And this is, uh, ooh, what's the French? Uh, is it in, in South America. Um, anyway, uh, Bolivia. Guiana, French Guiana, isn't it, I think? In South America, a poster here. But these transmit something known as Chagas' disease in South America. So this is a tryptosome. So they will uh, move along and take blood from you in those uh, areas. And they're known uh, commonly as kissing bugs because they thought they used to come along and, you know, take blood from your lips, but they actually take blood from quite a number of different regions um, around your head and other areas. And the process, they can actually transmit this uh, tryptosome to you, which in South America there is something like about 8 million people that are, uh, have Chagas disease and of deaths of about um, 12,000 a year from Chagas disease from these areas. Uh, Charles Darwin was thought to have Chagas disease, for instance, from his time in South America. The other complicating factor that we're beginning to realise with that is that 20 years down the line you can get organ failure. So you might have, you know, might have been taking blood for these, but there seems to be something that uh, does permanent damage. Uh, that can uh, have result in organ failure much later in your life. So beware of um, a kissing bugs in um, South America. Another way that you can defend yourself if you are getting lots and lots of phloem uh, is that you can have that honeydew to provide to something that wants it. In this case we're talking mostly ants. So ants can actually defend the uh, honeydew feeding or the phloem feeding insects. Quite common in mealybugs and aphids. So when they're screening large amounts of honeydew, the ants love them. They want that honeydew. They love that sugar. So in return, often they have little glands that the ants come along and touch and milk this little gland so they get their little sugary secretions and they uh, tend to them and look after them. In some cases, they take them down to their nest at night and take them up in the daytime. But we would be recognising, if you're looking at any plant, particularly in orcharding systems, where you're seeing ants moving up and around in that orchard, you would expect to find some sort of flow and feeding insect around there. That's what's going on. Citrus is a classic example. So these are defending those against um, other predators that might otherwise eat those um, hemiptera. Sound production. Okay, so we're going to make noises. How are we going to make noises? Um, we'll come to this again in electron communication, but we talked about the Orchidarinka. And they have um, timbals and tympanas. So here if we cut along the side of a cicada, this is the timbal, which is like a membrane, it's like a drum skin, and it produces the sound as you get sound pressure waves in there, produces the sound. And then the tympana here, underneath here, is the ear. So all equipped to hear and see. And it's generally the males that are making the call and the females that are uh, responding to that call. In some of the Orchinorinca, though, 
they communicate through substrate vibrations, so they're not necessarily making sound. In this case here, a lot of these sounds can be um, ultrasonic, so we don't hear them, they're outside of our hearing range, but with cicadas we obviously can, and they can reach something like about, uh, I think uh, the greengrocer here in Australia can reach about 120 decibels, which is the equivalent of sitting your ear alongside a jackhammer if you're right close to it at the time. They can get pretty loud. In, in Tasmania and in uh, the Kosciuszko region, the southern Alps of Australia, there is one primitive Gondwanan family known as Tetigarctids, and some of you will turn these up in your collections, know hairy cicadas. Um, they're equivalent to something that you see way back in the fossil record in the northern hemisphere. They actually have a noise-making structure, but no ear. So we're not really sure what goes on uh, with these. They might be some sort of you know, primitive link. Okay, let's have a look at economic impacts. What sort of um, impact does feeding have? Well, I said you're not going to see chewed leaves. You know, it just isn't going to happen with it. But what you will see is um, water and nutrient problems through loss of sap. So you will get wilting, uh, stunning of growth, distortion of parts, which can then lead on to things like I said, the loss of shoots, fruits, buds, leaves, etc. <coughs> You also will find blemishes on fruit, uh, so from where they actually have been inserting their uh, rostrum into the fruit, there will be marks on those fruit that will make it unsaleable. And the act of feeding on many of these things also provides an entry point for various pathogenic fungi that may reside in the area. So there's our first uh, link <coughs> to plant pathology, if you like, uh, in this particular example. Let's have a look at a couple of these as an example um, and this was actually the only example no, a few examples here so here's this heavy scale infestation scale of this sort of size will kill the stems this one's an interesting one this is an apple that's been distorted by feeding by a bug known as the Tasmanian apple dimpling bug uh, so you can see the massive distortion that has happened from the uh, feeding by the stylet it's rarely a problem today, but back in the 60s and stuff down the Huon Valley, they had very uh, significant problems with these until it was realised that the um, apple dimpling bug had an alternative host, which is the Monterey cypress pine. And if they got rid of the Monterey cypress pines out of the areas, then they got rid of their problem with apple dimpling bug because it wasn't there anymore. This is to remind you that it's not always going to result in damaging water and nutrient losses. Some have got sufficient uh, nutrients and resources to withstand it. So it's, you know, it does depend on circumstances at times. Here's some um, stunting. This is uh, black peri, uh, cherry and green peach aphids stunting. So these are caused by um, feeding of the uh, aphids. In some cases there are associated viruses and pathogens that uh, increase that sort of uh, distortion that we're seeing here. And these are mealy bugs, and it's another example of an issue that may arise. People are generally fairly insect phobic, so they don't like to buy something with an insect on it. And they often hide underneath the calyx here in an apple. Um, so, you know, the general domestic public's not happy, but certainly export has zero tolerance for these sort of things, so it requires a fair bit of um, attention to detail around those areas and treatment if necessary for export. I mentioned honeydew and I mentioned manna from heaven and I mentioned it as being something that um, ants like and will protect for. But honeydew itself can cause uh, blemishes on fruit and because of the, all that sugar is there, it promotes fun fungal growth. Then if you've got that fungal growth there, um, you get a sooty mould, like a black sooty mould that will come over the leaf surface and then um, you get less photosynthesis. So your plant is being impacted by your issue with um, an inability to produce the um, food resources that the plant needs. You also can get galling. Now, galling isn't just by hemiptera, but there are quite a few hemiptera that um, do produce galls. There are certainly wasps and flies that produce galls. But these can cause uh, nutrient uptake problems, particularly from the root, and reduce photosynthesis and energy loss because the energy goes into the gall or redacted into the gall. Uh, as an example of uh, gall, I want to just use woolly apple aphid. So this is um, a picture of the roots of an apple tree. 
uh, infested by, by woolly apple and you can see lots of galls on the uh, roots here uh, produced by woolly apple which obviously impact on nutrient uptake, etc. Okay, we're starting to link to plant pathology is plant viruses, which is Callum's little favourite area. Um, and the issue with uh, plant viruses is with flow and feeding bugs that have a style of sheath. So we're talking particularly the Sternorhynchia group, the aphids, the white flies uh, in particular, um, in the Orchinorhynchia, the leaf hoppers. But the main, main one that we probably want to point the finger at more than any is aphids, these little guys down here, for transmission of plant viruses. Aphids are an interesting group. In Australia, we don't necessarily have a lot of native species of aphid. In fact, the majority of aphid species in Australia are introduced. They're accidental. So we've got about 160 species now. In Australia, about 88 of those in Tasmania. We found a new aphid species only about five months ago in Tasmania from a member of the public. She sent in uh, some specimens and we realised that we had yet another invasive species of aphid in Tasmania. So we get quite a lot of these. Um, I can think of probably four that I'm aware of in the last decade that have got into Tasmania as invasive aphid species. We do have some natives um, in Tasmania, for instance, on Nothophagus, that uh, wonderful uh, bush that uh, is deciduous. You see it at Mount Field at Autumn. Uh, we do have an aphid associated with that. But the introduced species are the culprits for um, transmitting around several hundred viruses in Tasmania, we've got probably at least 30 viruses that are transmitted uh, by aphids. So let's have a bit of a more of a look at this whole issue of aphids and transmission, etc. It comes down to uh, a few issues in terms of managing them, and that is to do with life cycles. And we'll talk about aphid life cycles in the lecture and life history strategies because they are quite weird. Uh, but for the moment, I'm just interested in telling you one thing is that they can ha either be a aphid that spends its lifetime on one host uh, and that species only or they, within their life cycle they move from one host plant to another species of host plant or tree and onwards and so on. So they're host alternating and they're very different plant taxa. So for pest management transmission of viruses you've got the possibility that the virus transmitting aphid is on another host that you don't even know it's there until it's too late, okay? Or you can try control on one and it's still on the other one there. So it's much harder to control if it's heterocious than if it's monoecious. So this is the sort of level of specificity we've got here. Fairly specific. Well, we've got onion aphid on alliums, so the genus that onions from, cabbage aphid on all the family of cruciferae. So that's fairly specific and we might be able to understand where we might be able to find those aphids. Then we have these that um, have not a, a few more taxa outside of that sort of family level. So the willow carrot aphid feeds on willows but then disperses off onto carrots. Okay? And then we've got some that are just a nightmare to work with which are just highly prolific, so they'll eat anything. And that example of that is the green peach aphid which peach is a primary host, but it has secondary hosts across at least 40 different families of plant taxa. So you can imagine that one is everywhere and very hard to uh, control. In terms of transmissions of viruses, we have um, most of them are non-persistent transmissions. Um, I'm sure Callum will pick up this sort of figure with you at times, but um, in a non-persistent, you're picking up the virus on your mouth part from feeding, and therefore, for a period of an hour or so, you might be able to transmit that virus, but after that, the virus is dying on your mouth part, okay? So you a very short period of time window, and it's sort of random that you're fed on something that has a virus, and then you, within that time window, are fed on something else. An example of that is alfalfa mosaic virus. But we do have some instances of persistent uh, transmission where the aphid actually ingests the virus, and then the virus gets into the aphid and uh, infects it and develops within the aphid and then it comes out through the salivary secretions, right, uh, when you feed again. So in that case, the aphid is capable of transmitting the virus for the most of its life after having fed that. Barley yellow dwarf virus is an example of that. Okay, let's have a look at a couple of pest case studies uh, to finish up. I think I'm doing reasonably well at the time. So I do 
look at for this time. I cut down a few on what I've done in the past. Uh, look at Rutherglen Bug, uh, Willie Aphids, uh, Phloxra, which is an interesting case, and mention um, tomato potato salad as well. In terms of aphids, uh, well, I'll talk about aphids, get to aphids. Let's start with Rutherglen Bug here. So this is what Rutherglen Bug is. It doesn't look nearly that big. It's a tiny little thing, a couple of millimetres in size. Um, it's in the family Ligaeidae, and it's a big seed feeder. Okay, it really loves seeds, but it's fairly polyphagous, so weeds and lots of other things it'll be on. Um, but we have something that looks very much like Rutherglen Bug in Tasmania called Invermay Bug. It's the same genus. If you wanted to know the two, part comes down to whether you've got a hairy thorax or not. So you can see little hairs on the thorax here and none on this one. But Rutherglen Bug is the one that we're interested in. And Rutherglen Bug is a very hard insect to control and those who are involved with seed production, vegetable, hybrid vegetable seed production will be very familiar with how devastating Rutherglen Bug can be. So it's a native insect, but it makes sort of migratory flights from different regions in Australia. Uh, from subtropical to temperate, and it's even been found uh, on Macquarie Island, so it can move quite long distances in very short periods of time. When we get warm northwesterly winds, we believe that's when it moves, and it moves when its current resource that it's feeding on sort of dries up, so you know there's no more seed resources on those weeds, it's going to move off that onto something else. So when they come in, they're feeding on any parts of the plant, but particularly seeds, which are the most proteinaceous ones for them. Uh, and if they're moisture stressed. So you get several generations a year. So we're here in Tasmania when we're doing something like the carrot seed industry, they're spraying more than once a week at times to try and keep them out of the um, damaging the seed because your seed requires a certain percentage germination to be sold. And these are taking out uh, some of the seeds so they're becoming viable. So they're very hard and you don't know when they're going to turn up. When a northwesterly wind comes, one day they're not there and the next they're there. You know, so it's a very hard um, insect to work with and we're quite interested in that in terms of its uh, chemistry. Uh, woolly aphids. Now on your handout there I've also got a nice um, pest fact sheet around aphids and, and handling aphids and things. But we'll just look at woolly aphid at the moment. Now, we've already seen that galls on the roots of apples. So winter the woolly aphids go underneath, underground into the roots of the apple trees. Um, and that uh, has a lot of a problem for them, uh, for the apple trees. But uh, they're also, I could do pictures here, here's the one underneath. But when you see them above ground, they form these like cottony sort of appearances here. You can see a colony here uh, on a tree. And you get your apple trees covered with these things if you're not careful. There are two really important beneficials a parasitic wasp, Aphelinus malinite. Uh, Malai and also earwigs can prove excellent predators for these. And if we look at this one here, you can see this um, is the aphids, but you see these really dark aphids here that uh, haven't got that woolly cover over them anymore. They've been parasitized by little wasps, so you've got your beneficial in there, which is really good news. Uh, grapevine phylloxera is uh, the, the second last one I want to work with, and this one is an interesting history in the terms of wine production and vineyards. So it invaded Australia in 1877, but it had a, I think it was in about the 1860s or more, it got into Europe, and it devastated. I think it took out 70-80% of all uh, vineyards in Europe at the time. Um, and there was lots of rewards and things. It turns out it's probably the guy that visited from uh, North America that brought it across inadvertently on his whatever he came into, walk through vineyards on a tour through uh, France and then put this thing into uh, France. It's interesting because it's pretty much flightless. Uh, there is a slight uh, variant in North America that is uh, flighted, but it's flightless outside of North America. So you can hold it under containment um, by, um, by quarantining certain areas. Okay? So though it reached Australia in 1877, it's only now present in, still in isolated areas in Victoria and New South Wales. What you can do to help control it, it doesn't get rid of it, it's underground and it's uh, very hard causing galls on, on the roots, um, is that the root stock 
uh, certain rootstocks are more um, better for um, uh, managing phylloxera than others. And here we can see uh, a, a vineyard that there's many that have died in there, and that's all from phylloxera damage. In terms of Australia, here we've got zones, and these zones we know are infested with phylloxera, and you can't move any material outside of those. Any grapevine material, um, movement of people, etc., so that we can uh, maintain it only in those certain areas. So just by simple management zones and exclusion zones, we managed to keep it out of South Australia, West Australia, Tasmania, um, in certain important uh, grant winery regions for 120 years now, so uh, it's quite an interesting one. The last one I want to mention is one that we're really worried about here in Tasmania. Uh, Callum Wilson, uh, for the other lecturer in here, and I worked in this for about six years, and, uh, and Rayleigh uh, Parr, who is your chief demonstrator, all worked on um, a monitoring system for the east coast of Australia and Tasmania for this. Um, it's tomato potato silage. It got into New Zealand from America. Uh, what it does is it creates all sorts of um, imperfections in the potato. You see it cut open there and all your chipping mark and thing is destroyed. Um, it now found its way into West Australia. In, that's 2017, so two years ago now into Western Australia, but unfortunately the, the bacteria that has this sort of effect does not seem to have got in. It's only the uh, tomato potato silver, which we've drawn a nice computer generated illustration that we made up for um, farmers with that one. So that one's one to keep out, uh, look for, and I've put that on the back of your handout here to have a look at, um, because if we see these things then we've got to be really worried, um, particularly if it has the uh, associated bacteria with it, which will be devastating and the amount of spraying we'll have to use is, is extraordinary. All right, that finishes uh, the lecture.